Hello and welcome to Business Finishing School. Let your business brain finish what your entrepreneurial heart started. Our catalyzing statement is a successful entrepreneur inside of every business. Enjoy this module. Hello and welcome to module 41, the art of the level head. Now Rick, I'm worried about the jokes you might make relative to that. <laughs> but when we talk about the art of the level head, what is the context for that? I say, and we both agree, you know, when we're planning these modules out, we want to make sure we give people tremendous value every time. We want to give you a new perspective to look at your life. And when you add up cumulatively all the things you've learned, we're now 41 modules in. This is one more perspective, and it's an art. It is not a science. And the level head is one of the most basic but powerful tools that you can possibly possess in business and in life. As an example, I think about Dan, my friend, who at the smallest thing, he flies off the handle. Now he's someone who outwardly flies off the handle, so you could see he clearly doesn't have a level head. But most of us in, internally were blowing up at the slightest provocation. So it's very, very important on this journey of life to look at every moment that you have, the moment that we have right now together where you're listening to Patrick and I, is a gift. No matter what happens, you've got to figure out the art, and it takes practice, to keep a level head no matter what is going on. I think back to all the billionaires that I've interacted with and you got to experience some of that in the year one module Billionaire Mind and what struck me as I think back to all of those days weeks months that I spent with these people was that no matter what situation we encountered it didn't matter what it was but there was always a confidence in the people that were around those settings that a level head would prevail and, you know, I think back to my brother, I've talked about him in an earlier module, he's 11 years older than me, I remember when he started his first business, it was chaos 24-7, I remember cell phones going off, he had three phones going at the same time, and I used to think that was success, but there was a lot of arguments, there was a lot of negativity, there was a lot of negotiating, not in a positive way, but a negative way, and that's just the opposite of a level head. So Patrick and I are going to be digging into, over the next 30 minutes or so, what does it mean to have a level head? What does the art of the level head really mean to you? And how do we keep it together in the face of negativity? You know, again, this ties very much into legacy. Um, there's the old adage that's 100% true, that you could spend decades building something, building your reputation, building your business, building whatever it is, but you can blow it all up in a matter of literally minutes. And this is where being level-headed becomes so critical because your legacy can be destroyed. You can spend your whole life. I mean, how many people can we, uh, can we cite politicians and business people and celebrities who basically have Years, decades of uh, service, uh, decades of a body of work that they've done. Uh, I was just reading an article yesterday. Uh, uh, I'm not going to mention names, but this British uh, lead man, singer of a, of a very popular band, especially in Europe. Millions of albums they've sold, etc. And, and this really, I think, engulfs the whole theme here, where he... Uh, you know, had this following. He had friends and people who relied on him, and and people that took the journey with him, and his bandmates. Imagine, you know, these guys are you know were lined up to get inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and his bandmates, you know, obviously trusted him, and you know he was you know the front man, the creative guy, etc. But these guys were in the band, and, and you know years were spent with this guy. Turns out he's just like you know, ridiculous pedophile and he did some really stupid things and got caught. Mm -hmm. So he literally blew up everything over a moment of indiscretion or a couple of moments of indiscretion that were stupid, but that only destroys his own legacy. 
rather than being remembered for you know the, these uh, you know, this incredible art that he brought to the world, he destroyed it for his bandmates. They can never get it back. The, the whole legacy is destroyed here. So uh, I'm not saying that it has to even be that extreme. In your own business, there could be um, an employee who's completely pissed you off and who basically has uh, you know, done something that you're really upset about. But imagine that you blow up and you take some actions against that person or say something in a moment of you know, being hot-headed that now can bring a lawsuit, can you know, get put in the papers, can get other employees maybe to now you know, either leave or start to you know, get shaken. Literally, all of the stuff that you built can be under, you know, undermined, can be destroyed because you didn't keep a level head. Now, how can this kind of stuff happen? I can, as many of you, I think, have been through episodes of time where things got tough. Um, 2007 into 2008 when the economy crashed, my company was very much dependent on the credit markets. Most people leased our technology. Um, the, you know, the, the, the economy crashes, the credit markets crash. I have to literally reduce our workforce by 30%. I have to take all those tough time CEO actions that literally I'm laying off single mothers, right? Because the company just cannot sustain holding the payroll that it had because of the adverse impact the economy had on our business at that moment in time. Very, very stressful. So what does that do? It makes you, you know, hot headed. It puts you to the brink. It makes you what I call a hot reactor where small things might set you off. So with all the stress that entrepreneurs invariably are going to feel, you can be pushed to the brink, and if you let your hot-headedness impact you, you can erupt. And that eruption could be devastating. So now that you're in year four, this is a little bit about getting into the zen of business a little bit. This is a little bit about you know how to preserve your legacy on an ongoing basis, and you know I went through challenges where I had literally on the front page of trade magazines complete lies fabricated about me. So just telling some of my own personal stories, um, Rick and I we we were in our accountability group together. It was kind of in the first year or second year of our accountability group, and I had somebody a competitor, if you can imagine publish an article on the front page of a, of a paper that went to every chiropractor in the profession, and that was my world, that said that I had been found by an investigative committee in the U.S. Senate to be in violation of two federal statutes. There's not a word of truth to any of it. It's not even like a semblance of truth. The article said that I defrauded NASA. NASA, <laughs> right? Um, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of thing that, that when, when a lie is so big and so bold that nobody could possibly believe it's a lie, I mean, who, who could say that if it wasn't true? I mean, it's so egregious. There's no way somebody would be printing this and saying this. Well, it's what happened. And I can remember after 20 years of being in this business, of doing what I've done, building everything, this comes out, and it was a grudge thing where two people got together who had a grudge and conspired to try to take me down. And I remember I brought this to our accountability call, and I had to go into war room mode and you know all the stuff and hire a PR company and you know what are we going to do and this, and certainly there's some actions that had to be taken. I couldn't be completely passive, but you had advice for me based on your own situation that was probably even more amplified than mine in many ways because you were in a public business, you know, a, you know, a company that was a public company. Um, and you just said, get up in the morning, go, go through your normal routines, show up for your meetings, don't, don't start canceling all your meetings and changing everything, going into reaction. Show confidence, show stoicness, show leadership, and don't cancel everything. So 
And I have to say that because I kept a level head, did what needed to be done, and we responded. I, I got to say, in all my years as a CEO is maybe my proudest episode in time as a CEO to navigate those waters with a level head the way that we did. And then, you know, basically, it ended up as a backlash against the people who spread the lies because everybody started to figure out it was lies. But ultimately, and, and incidentally, the one guy who published it melted down and is completely out from the, the business at this point. Uh, so it all came back to haunt them. But, it, but if I overreacted, if I didn't keep a level head, the outcome would have been very, very different and could have been disastrous for me. So what was it that got you to give me that advice? Well, I'm going to get into that part of the story in a moment. I just want to say, as a leader, you have a responsibility to lead. Mm -hmm. And when you blow up and when you overreact to anything, that becomes the dominant culture that you are in because people are looking you to lead. When you overreact in your marriage, that allows your spouse to overreact back to you. It doesn't matter what happens to you. There, in my opinion, there's never a good reason to not have a level head. Now, I've been through a lot of different experiences, as Pat has my entire life. I've seen some crazy things in my life. But it doesn't matter what the situation is. I always say to myself, someone somewhere in the world has experienced far worse. As an example, I was involved uh, 11 years ago now in a, in a tremendous lawsuit in which a, a company was trying to take us down at the time. It was actually the, the company and the U.S. government. And I decided, let me first interview some people that have been through a similar thing. And I found the gentleman who was, had been through a very similar event a few years before. And when I talked to him, this guy had aged. It was unbelievable how much he aged. He was harboring bitterness. I asked him how he reacted when it first happened. He said, well, what do you mean? I reacted like anybody else would react. I drank a lot of whiskey and I curled up on a ball and I cried for a few weeks. And I said, really? With 100 employees, that's what you did? Mm -hmm. And so I was so uh, grateful to have witnessed what this person did because it, it, it left me with such an impression that I did the exact opposite. And as I said uh, to Patrick and the coaching I gave to him was, I didn't miss a workout. I didn't miss a meeting of any kind. I just kept my life uh, and, and ran it as normal as I could possibly run it. We all will encounter storms. And as we taught you in the uh, module on the battleship principle, it's up to you to fortify your ship, so to speak, so that you can withstand any storm. And that's the purpose of this module. It's not a matter of, oh, oh man, will, will that ever happen to me? Of course it will. Bad things happen to good people all the time. But... When you train yourself to keep a level head, those bad things become minimized. And as your ship becomes more and more and more fortified, these bad events become more and more insignificant. I remember an interesting story when I was sitting down with one of the billionaires from Module 6 that we talked about. Um, I said, how many lawsuits are you involved in right now? And he said, you mean big ones? I said, well, I guess, yeah, big ones. He goes, oh, about 75, you know, with <laughs> governments all over the world. And here is a person sipping wine and champagne without a worry in the world, and yet he had 75 lawsuits going on at the same time. That's someone who clearly understands the art of a level head. Now, I want to react to something that Patrick talked about. Everything that you do in your life, every single thing that you do, when people are watching you or when no one is watching you, imagine that the New York Times is running a front page story describing exactly what you did. When you think about all of your actions, you talked about the, the person who was a pedophile. If you think about all your actions being posted in the, in the New York Times for the entire world to see, for your friends and your family to read about you, Think about it from that perspective the next time you're going to do something that you're not proud of. That's also the art of the level head. All of us have urges and needs and desires, but maturity handles most of that for us. So the art of the level head also takes us to those decisions that, you know, they're fun or they're spontaneous or they're, they fulfill an urge, but they're not mature and they're not helping anybody else. 
and they're selfish in nature. So keep a level head, even in situations like that, and imagine that the world will read everything uh, that you're doing. Another thing to think about is, uh, on the way to see Patrick on this trip, it was interesting. Um, I didn't realize it, but I gradually, uh, I was driving a car, a rent a car, and I gradually leaned over into the other lane. And the person that I, uh, that, you know, it, it wasn't even near an accident. I was probably five feet away from him. But this person absolutely positively blew their mind in the car. It was a taxi driver with two passengers in the back seat, and he was honking his horn, and he was calling me every name in the book, and he absolutely lost his mind. Now, my very, very basic instinctual response at, at the beginning was to react. And then I just said to myself, I love this person, and I'm sure they're having a rough day. And it changed everything. I slowed my car down, I let the person pass, and I want to use that metaphor for you in any situation in life. I was sitting down with my uh, coach, Vid, who I've had for eight years now. And he said there's an old Zen story about two people are in, engaged in a conversation that's about to escalate in a negative way. And what often happens is it's, it's akin to one of them pulls out a bar, bow and arrow and shoots an arrow in our direction. And as that arrow is coming toward us, what are we doing as that arrow is coming toward us? What are we doing as those words are coming toward us that we don't want to hear, that we don't like, that our spouse may be saying, or a business partner may be saying, or a client may be saying? All we're doing is we're reaching for our arrows and our quiver, ready to shoot one back. And the way the story goes is, allow the arrow to hit you. Or maybe move your head to the side and allow it to pass you. But just absorb it. Absorb it. Don't react. Don't shoot another arrow back. Because people are watching. And I think it's a leader's responsibility to keep a level head in all situations that expounds a culture of an organization. If you have a very reactionary culture, because you're very reactionary, you've heard the expression, as the leader goes, so goes the organization. Well, if you're very reactionary, everybody associated with your company is going to be reactionary. If you're very zen-like in your responses to things and you have a level head all the time, that's going to become the culture. So level heads beget level heads. I want to read a quote in conjunction with this topic that's about gratitude. And it's by Melody Beattie. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It could turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. If you have this attitude of gratitude all the time and you're grateful for every moment of your life, because it is a gift. I mean, you really think about the millions of things that have to go right for you to even be here listening to this program, be here on this planet. If you think about it from the perspective of gratitude, I would say it would be impossible to not have a level head virtually all the time. Now, there could be some catastrophic event that needs your attention, like you see your little kid run into the street. That's different. You've got to react to a situation to protect somebody uh, that you love. But I'm talking more about these stories that we invent in our head to escalate situations. And they add stress into our bodies. They add chaos into our lives. They destroy relationships, all because we couldn't keep a level head when we should have. And even then, it's almost when level heads are most important uh, in a crisis. I mean, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've come across a few car accidents where you know there's fatalities and so on and people are you know their lives are hanging in the balance and you can't freak out um you know where you're you know they're hemorrhaging and you've got to try to stop the hemorrhaging and and you know you, you got to just get extremely focused and extremely level-headed when my little son who at the time was three years old and he got face went launched face first into a glass table and his nose was hanging off his face that's the time that you have to stay very level-headed 
uh, so that because everybody else is freaking out, and you got to calm the situation down. Otherwise, it's going to degenerate and get worse quickly. So you you know it it's, it it means that you do need to respond, and you have to do it almost heroically. But you have to do it not you know out of uh, angst or you know your arms are waving and you're screaming and you know you're getting hysterical. You got to pull yourself together. You got to get hyper focused, and you have to be a leader and address the situation. Um, I could tell you also, uh, you know, I, in, in my own profession, I've been very involved politically at the highest levels of politics, and there are warring factions sometimes. Um, and I can remember literally only using the exact terms: people are uh, an argument between two of the, you know, the, the political factions that are warring is escalating, and I'm standing there saying. Keep a level head. Level heads prevail. In other words, keep your eye on what is the goal that we're trying to accomplish here. Not you said this and blah blah blah. Well, you said that and you, you know, and you son of a bitch. And you know, this type of escalation goes on, and you can see pretty quickly. It's like you know, that's how a nuclear holocaust would happen, right? Is that it's kind of the it, things get amped up if there if there's no level head in in the uh, circumstance to try to prevent. Uh, or to try to keep people focused on what the end game is, uh, it can get disastrous pretty quickly, very quickly. So um, you know, it's. I think again, it's a year four thing. It's a it's a show of maturity. Um, I am an excitable you know type of person. You know, could be you know in my. I, I characterized myself in my younger years as an angry young man. You know, I wanted to go out and conquer the world. I was going to pose my will everywhere that I could. If there's people that was going to pose me, I was going to run them over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you need, you know, it, it, over time, you know, it's like the uh, old bull and young bull, that, that old parable that if you don't know it, I'm not going to get into it because it's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit off color. But the bottom line is that with time, I think, and with wisdom, you begin to learn pretty quickly how important it is that you maintain a level head, uh, not only, and in, in, in Rick, we should talk about the other side of this, not only when there's challenge and, and potential disaster on the horizon, but how about when opportunity occurs? How about, oh my God, somebody, so-and-so came in, they want to buy the company, or so-and-so came in and they want to invest, or so-and-so, you know, and, and there's this major opportunity. Imagine that you have this big opportunity and you start getting all manic about it. That's when you really need to come there. Think of yourself like a poker player. <laughs> Imagine you're at the World Series of Poker, and, um, and there's millions of dollars on the table and all the prestige of being a champion at the World Series of Poker. And imagine you just get dealt pocket aces. How are you going to react? Are you going to suddenly get a big smile on your face and start bouncing up and down in your chair and think, oh my God, I got it, I got it, it's good. Or are you going to sit there very calmly, very measured, and just play your hand to win the tournament? You're making me think, Patrick, of the word uh, that is the opposite of paranoid. We've been talking about a lot in our accountability group. And it's a new word. You can Google it, and it's uh, pronounced pronoia. And it's the opposite of paranoid. And it's, uh, the definition is the universe is conspiring to bring good fortune to you. Imagine that every situation that happens to you, no matter what it is, negative, could be negative, could be positive, but imagine negative, that the universe is bringing that situation to you to give you an opportunity to learn something new about yourself. I tell my very young son, I said, every time you're frustrated and, and upset, your brain is growing because it's helping you to deal with something that you're not good at dealing with and he goes really daddy is that what's happening can I see it grow and I said well I guess if you had a microscope you could see it grow so think about it from the perspective of pro noia I think back to my days of uh, doing turnarounds inside companies and uh, oftentimes if a turnaround person doesn't come in the company goes bankrupt and everybody loses their job so it's a very very difficult job to go in as a manager and turn a business around. And the first thing I like to do is get all the employees into a room. And I like to keep a very level head in a situation like this. I've done it about 20 times. And I'll tell all the employees, here's the situation. If we don't make radical cuts, then everybody will lose their job. So here's the plan. We're going to cut this, cut this, and cut this. 
And invariably, you always have the two sides. You have uh, one side one that fit in one camp of people that understand this is for the good of the whole. And the other side, the other half, is people that go through life and say, why me? You don't understand my situation. You don't, you don't understand my situation. And you're, and you're saying, which part of, if we don't all do this together, do you not understand? And I think people go through life too often, why meing themselves to death? And that is a victim perspective that gets you absolutely positively nowhere. So it's a very easy way to determine if someone's a manager and an executive talent or if someone's always going to be an employee for the rest of their life. Because someone that's always going to be an employee the rest of their life always says, why me? How could they do that to me? That is not a level head. So imagine as you're going through life and you're thinking about this module, like why did Patrick and Rick include this in the legacy module? The reason is very simple. Every single person that I respect, that I look up to, that I want to emulate, every single one of them had an extremely level head, no matter what catastrophic event they were going through. And I believe it's that character trait that will do more to help you have a legacy that's much bigger than it could be if you don't master that art. Uh, That character trait of keeping a level head no matter what. So say to yourself, no matter what you're going through, I am being tested. My brain is growing while I am working myself out of this situation. I am being tested. This is pronoia at its best. The universe is giving me this situation because they're conspiring to make me a great person. So next, let's talk about this premise. I believe that you're not born with a level head. I believe it's a discipline. So you might say, how do you acquire a level head? By nature, entrepreneurs are sort of emotional, right? They get charged up. They get emotionally charged. They're prone to high highs and low lows. Mediocre people don't have, you know, swings of emotions. They're just kind of numb to the world. So by nature, the entrepreneur is typically somebody who's capable of of being a hot reactor, you know, getting very manic or, or getting very angry. So you might say, well, then what are the things that I could do to improve my level-headedness? The answer is many-fold. Um, and I think maybe one of the most important ones, well, for me at least, is uh, quiet time, taking time for meditation. Now, depending on your own orientation, spirituality, etc., whether you know it's prayer, meditation, whatever you want to call it, uh, I think they're all kind of um, associated, associated ideas. But ultimately, if you are constantly dealing with input, 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 and you're constantly dealing with processing, 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 there's no time for your brain and therefore your physiology to calm down. Um, I have found, and I've trained in you know, martial arts for a lot of years. Um, I'll give an example of the type of training you know, I used to do when I was in my teens. To teach us to not be hot reactors, we used to have to meditate in that class. We'd be fighting, we'd be you know, you know, getting you know, into states of really heightened physiology, and then we'd have to kneel, put our hands in our laps, slightly bow our heads and just focus on our breathing and empty our minds and learn to recover very quickly. One of the things we used to have to do is you take one guy, you blindfold him, and then a circle of other guys would be around that person, and each of the people who were around the circle would attack the blindfolded person. And that blindfolded person had to learn to relax into those attacks so that they can feel their way through what, ex- what they had to do to repel it, to evade it, what have you. Interesting training, right? Where you're learning to under stress rather than tighten up, chill out. So I believe that a regular prayer or meditation practice can be very, very useful. Not long ago, my wife and I went out to Fairfield, uh, Iowa, and we did transcendental meditation training. And their practice just as one example, 
is 20 minutes twice a day. So 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And you learn to just clear your mind and calm down. Now, the research on this is extraordinary insofar as the impact it has on executives, on inmates in jails, one of the most extraordinary ones on inner city schools, when they, when they introduced twice a day meditation for 20 minutes, how fights decreased, how academic performance increased. Basically, it created level heads that were able to process the stress of life in a much more robust way. So my question for you is looking at your patterns, and this incidentally starts to pick up off of the Keystone Habit module that you had just recently. It starts to pick up on that and say, is there a habit that you can introduce into your life right now that would allow you to decrease your stress levels or increase your bandwidth as far as your mental capacity to deal with um, life and all the challenges that life presents? Imagine if you're under a lot of stress at work and you come home and then you have children who are, uh, you know, demanding your time or effort or energy. Do you react? Do you snap, etc.? I mean, some of this is almost trite. You hear about this all the time. But I don't know if you hear about it in this particular context that you want to become a person, that it's a value of yours. It's a part of the character traits that you want to adopt, that you want to become an extremely level-headed person. doesn't mean you're not passionate. doesn't mean you're not energized. It just means that you're level-headed. So I believe that if you were to adopt habits that would, and you could say, well, exercise would help me do that. Eating healthier, yes, all those things would. But I also believe that this is very much a mental game, not a physical one. And that you have to have some mental disciplines that just give you bandwidth. Another one might be if you're musically inclined at all. Um, you know, I keep in my office here a guitar right outside my office door. I've got an electric piano and, and uh, other guitars, electric guitars and so on. When I feel like I'm getting strained and stressed and I feel like my mind is at its limit, I rather than let it go because you get unhealthy and then suddenly you just, you know, you, 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 it almost feeds on itself. I'll get up, I'll go sit at the piano and I'll play a couple of songs that I know are just going to calm me down and bring me peace and put me into a peaceful state. Then I can come back five minutes later, sit in my chair, and I've just purposefully put myself into a level-headed state so I can continue to process my day without overreacting. It takes an enormous amount of discipline and self-discipline. So there's a large volume of information out there that could you know, help you with the actual disciplines. I'm just naming some of the more conventional ones right now and what I do personally. But ultimately, um, this is something I think becomes very important as far as legacy and it becomes very important as far as maturity you know, in year four of this program. The last thing I'm going to say about this and turn it over to, to Rick to, to close it out. You don't, it's not a matter of either you have a level head or you don't. It's a matter of degree. It's not a matter of, oh, they are level-headed or they are not level-headed. It's a matter of to what degree can you be level-headed, and it's a matter of expanding that. So it's not either or. It's, it's really a matter of degree. And quite frankly, when you master this and you expand your degree of level-headedness enough, then you kind of transform and you become a different person in kind. So wherever you are right now, even if you say, you know, I'm fairly level-headed, I believe you could take it further. And when you do take it further, I believe it opens you up to new possibilities that you're not available to right now because you couldn't handle it. So with all that, Rick, do you have any final words on the art of level-headedness? <laughs> yeah, I want to close it out with a couple of personal things uh, to me. I grew up in a home, uh, as many of you know, I was one of nine kids. My mother was never emotionally stable. And she was not a yeller, she was a screamer. My mother constantly screamed at, at the kids. She couldn't handle uh, being a mother. She didn't feel like the world was fair. Uh, she had lost a son uh, when I was a baby. My brother died. She had lost a husband. Uh, she had a very, very rough childhood, and she took it out on herself and on the kids. 
And I always said as a kid, uh, keeping a level head, that I never wanted to be that type of parent. Well, there's now uh, been research that was recently published, you can Google it to find it, about what are the effects of yelling on kids. And fortunately, I'm not sure how, but I feel like I survived a lot of what the research indicated, but uh, most of the children that they uh, had done research on who had parents that yell, I think like 55% of them had issues, uh, emotional issues, they had uh, problems concentrating, they had low confidence, low self-esteem, because they were constantly in fear of being yelled at. So your children are affected by your reactions, your employees are affected by your reactions, your legacy is affected by your reactions, so be extremely careful. I am unbelievably blessed that my wife is open to all of these things that we talk about, uh, my wife Melissa, and we have made a commitment to not yell at our children. We have four children, and it's extremely, extremely rare that you hear anyone yelling uh, in our house who is an adult. You'll hear kids yelling from time to time, but we like to live in a very calm household, and I feel proud of that. Uh, my wife and I go to marriage counseling. Uh, we, we firmly believe in coaching. And uh, I'll never forget, it was relatively recently where the uh, marriage counselor said to my wife, what is, Rick, what is Rick like when he's really, really mad? And my wife was hesitating for a while. And the, 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 the psychiatrist said, well, just tell me about the last time he was really mad. And I couldn't believe that she said this, but my wife said, um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen Rick mad. Now, you have to put that in context because what happened is the, the uh, psychiatrist got very upset and she says, no one can go through life not being mad. There's something wrong with you. You're holding your emotions back. And my wife said to the lady, actually, Rick's extremely emotional. He just doesn't get mad. And I like to direct my anger towards more positive things. I have realized a long time ago that anger doesn't solve anything. So it doesn't mean if you don't get angry that you're not emotional. I'm extremely passionate about my life and my interests and my children and my marriage and this program and all the things I'm involved in. But I think anger and not keeping a level head is one of those debilitating reactions that hurt relationships, hurt businesses, hurt progress. So Patrick and I will leave you now with a lot to think about. There's an implementation guide as always associated with this module. Thanks for listening. Let your business brain finish what your entrepreneurial heart started.